Hi, my name is Konstantin Kogan, and I'm uh, your host of Holistic Investment. And I'm delighted to, to host today our guest, Brooke Pollock, who's a founder and managing partner of Hot Capital. Hi, Brooke. Hey, Konstantin. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me on. Likewise. And uh, traditionally, before we start, I have to read uh, a legal disclaimer that this content is for inter informational purposes only. You should not construe any such information or other material as legal, tax, investment, financial, or any other advice. So without further ado, uh, we're going to start exploring the world of uh, uh, blockchain venture capital fund of funds. Uh, and it's uh, quite interesting because, you know, we are the first fund of funds in the, well, I would say, traditional aspect of this fund of fund world. And uh, Brooke, uh, you are the first, uh, I would say, uh, venture uh, fund of funds. So tell us a little bit about your story. Why you, how do you get to crypto first? And why did you choose specifically this strategy? Yeah, of course. So, you know, it'd probably be helpful to give some you know, general context on my background and then, you know, I'll speak to how, in, how I got into this space. Uh, so my background start, prior to starting Hunt Capital was 10 years in the institutional LP world focused on, on private markets. So, you know, I started my career working for a family office consultant and, you know, the firm overall did, did basically everything in terms of the services we offered for families. But specifically, I worked on the private markets team and not a hedge fund. So that included venture capital, but also things like buyouts and energy, real estate, credit, um, you know, timber, all, all sorts of other random strategies. And you know, really enjoyed that. It was a great introduction to the private markets and kind of learning about all the different strategies. And you know, after that, spent some time in the secondaries world. So I worked for a firm called Hamilton Lane. It's a broader firm. So we managed a fund that bought limited partnership interests in other, you know, other funds. Um, you know, so we'd buy out LPs in those funds. It would help GPs to restructure their funds, give them additional runway um, and ability to continue following on in their investments. It would help captive venture and private equity funds to spin out from like a corporate or a bank parent, for example, and kind of a similar idea where we'd, you know, give them um, outside capital and help them to get more runway. So basically anything where you're buying existing portfolio of assets, portfolio of assets from a, managed by a third party. Um, after that, had the good fortune of joining a firm called Greenspring Associates, which is a venture capital platform you know, these days with, I, I think, over 10 billion of, of assets. And, you know, they are a combination of some of your more established, well-known funds, as well as a lot of kind of micro and emerging managers, you know, doing both um, direct and fund secondaries. So as I described earlier, we're buying limited partnership interest, but of course this is all in venture capital funds, uh, as well as buying stock from founders, management, early employees at a later stage, um, you know, doing direct secondaries, and then doing very traditional, you know, growth stage venture investing. Um, so we really, really enjoyed all that. Um, you know, helped in particular to build out their secondary business. And then the, the last year I was there, spearheaded their efforts in the blockchain space. So on that side of it, you know, that really just came out of long personal interest and, you know, it caught my attention. I mean, you know, we, we all graduated after, uh, well, I guess before Bitcoin came into existence, but, you know, it caught my attention. They're doing some interesting stuff. And, you know, and frankly, the first time I came across it, I, I didn't fully grasp what I was looking at and, and, you know, fully understand it. But, you know, with tracking their progress and then once I started doing venture full time, which was mid-2014, you know, started taking a bit of a closer look at it. So it really wasn't until 2017 that, you know, there was a little more overlap between my day job and my interest in this space. We started seeing a lot of these dedicated blockchain venture funds emerge in 2017. So at that point, you know, went out there, you know, got to know all these funds, built those relationships, um, and, you know, ended up spearing Greenspring's efforts in the space as part of that for the last year I was there. Um, and, you know, I... I just became very, very, uh, you know, excited about what I was seeing in this space and you wanted to spend my full time attention on it. You know, it wasn't a, a big area of focus for, for us at Greenspring. So, you know, left to pursue that piece of my work full time. And, you know, in particular, uh, you know, we had a pretty broad purview into innovation and technology and startups at Greenspring, given the breadth of their platform. So, you know, a lot of the areas that money had been pretty reliably made for 10 to 15 years, areas like software and cloud and um, e-commerce and marketplaces and on-demand and, and stuff like that, you know, I, I felt the opportunities were getting, you know, more and more saturated, you know, more and more competitive um, in terms of the amount of capital chasing those deals. And, 
I was like, okay, well, like, where is real innovation going to come from in the next 10 to 15 years? When, where is real venture type returns going to come from? And came to the conclusion that, you know, blockchain and crypto was the answer to that. In short, you're using a similar model to Greenspring, but within the blockchain space. So, you know, I, I can go into more depth or not of, of what we do, but, you know, we're a blockchain venture fund of funds and direct investment firm. So, you know, we invest in closed end blockchain funds um, as a fund of funds. And then we also invest directly um, at a growth stage in, in the equity of startups. Amazing. So this is a quite a interesting strategy. And uh, I'm sure you've already due diligence a lot of uh, venture funds and crypto space. So maybe you can help us to understand what is the process of your due diligence? Like, what are you looking at? Like, you know, what, what, what funds are, uh, you know, catching your eye first? And why do you consider investing in them? Maybe you can help us mm -hmm. to understand. Yeah, of course. And, and maybe to get maybe for some background, you know, in terms of context, like what, what does that universe look like in the first place as well? Yes, you know, so we're currently tracking uh, 67, 68 blockchain venture funds. And again, these are all closed end, you know, dedicated funds. So yeah, it's a pretty, pretty sizable universe. And it's really a market of emerging managers. And, you know, that's a, that's a global figure. So we're tracking funds on a global basis for reference. So, you know, when you're looking at, you know, a lot of more traditional funds, you know, and I spent a lot of time doing that in the past, you know, often you have 10, 20 year track records that you can look at. And, you know, that plays, of course, a big part of your diligence and, you know, among other things. But in this space, because everyone is so young as a firm, you don't have like those long track records you can go off of. Um, you know, the, the oldest firms are only what, six, seven years old. And, you know, most of the funds haven't been around for more than two or three years. And, you know, even for, you know, the ones that have been around for longer, there's only two funds that are on fund three or later. So, you know, it's, it ends up being a much more qualitative process. And, you know, we, we still do a lot of work around existing portfolios in terms of coming the data a lot of different ways, you know, trying to figure out, you know, where they've been success, successful and unsuccessful and digging into sourcing and, and all of that. But, you know, it, it's just, if it's a first time fund, for example, or maybe a second time fund where you're looking at the fund one portfolio, you know, the, the data, um, you know, it tends to be pretty young. So it still has a ways to, to play out. So, you know, at the end of the day, you know, one, we need to know all the funds in this space in order to have proper context of what the landscape looks like and you know, really be able to compare what the different funds look like. So, you know, of course, it's important to have you know, a view of, okay, what do all the different funds look like? What's the landscape look like? And then you know, use that as proper context as you're evaluating funds and being able to compare them against each other. So yeah, at the end of the day, if, if you're doing venture, and this isn't specific to watching, of course, but you, know, you really, really need to have access to the best funds and there's going to be a relatively smaller number of funds that emerge who are kind of, let's say that, that top quartile or top, top decile on a repeatable basis who are you know, really providing outsized returns to, to LPs. You know, so our job is effectively to you know, understand the landscape, build those relationships with the funds, and then determine who are those funds going to be and you know, get access to those funds on behalf of our LPs. So... You know, a lot of that is more qualitative where, you know, we're fortunate to have built out a very good network in this space and have relationships where we can go out and not just say, okay, you know, what's your strategy? You know, can we make some calls off your references, but like really go out to the market and, you know, use our network, talk around, like, you know, talk to entrepreneurs, talk to other funds, you know, et cetera, and really get to the bottom of, you know, who's truly seen the best deal flow, you know, who do, who do, other, who do other VCs like working with? you know, who are the top founders going to for, for funding? And, you know, that's going to be a, a key indicator of, you know, who is most likely to have the best returns. Um, you know, we also, as I alluded to earlier, invest globally. You know, we want to provide broad exposure to blockchain innovation, right? So we don't want, I mean, I'm just making this up, but I don't know, 10, 10 funds that are all focused on DeFi or 10 funds that are only investing in crypto exchanges or whatever it might be. Right. So we also, from a portfolio construction standpoint, value different viewpoints and, you know, folks who are focused in different parts of the markets and have different opinions um, in order to kind of, you know, truly build a well-rounded portfolio. So that certainly comes into play for, for that process as well. Um, and, you know, and, and given, of course, that you don't have, you know, the same 
uh, breadth of track record, the referencing, as I alluded to earlier, is, is super important. If you're looking at a fund like, okay, here's our portfolio. I mean, if, if you don't recognize any of those names, if you have no idea what any of those companies or networks do or why they might be interesting to be an investor in, it, it makes it very tough to do diligence. So, you know, just, you know similar to, to you guys, you know, ha- having that sector expertise and ability to actually understand what they're doing and, you know, thus ask the right questions and have a proper perspective on, you know, their portfolio and the approach is, is very important in my view. So just to make sure I understand, like if, imagine there is a venture, uh, as you mentioned, that there is a uh, emergent managers predominantly, right? And there's a one year venture capital firm that you have great references, they already made some great investments, but like, it's hard to calculate, you know, like how, like qualitatively, what's it going to be like still like, you know, if it's a eight plus two years, uh, you know, like lockup and they're like long term, they've developed the vision that that's going to be the next unicorn. So, and then and out of 69, you mentioned, right, you know, like imagine you have like 10 funds like that. So still, still give us some, maybe some three practical parameters, right? You know, how would you still like, you know, distill out of those 10 and you would pick those three uh, that you consider are the best? Yeah, of course. So, I mean, you know, and for context, we, we invest in 10 to 12 funds from our own funds. That's kind of like the, you know, the whittling down that, that we do. But, um, you know, so a, a key piece of it is just having a high level of, um, I don't know, maybe certainty is the wrong word, but a high level of probability in our minds that these funds are going to be highly successful while minimizing both financial and operational risk. And, you know, the operational piece in particular, just given these our emerging managers is, is also very important. So how, how can you gain that high level of probability in our mind that they're going to be very successful? And, you know, sometimes that comes through, okay, it's a fun, fun tour later. And, you know, they've clearly proven that they can, you know, attract real, real high quality founders you know, do, do a very good job in terms of deal selection and execution. And, you know, the go forward, the go forward strategy is very consistent such that we, we believe they can continue to execute and be successful on that. Um, You know, when you don't have that prior track record, it's, it's much more difficult because, you know, you're really just going based off their strategy, off their relationships you know, off their reputation in the space and, you know, how are they truly going to differentiate themselves as a first time fund, you know, and attract top founders. I mean, that's not an easy thing to do when you have all these different funds to choose from. So, you know, it's a much higher bar for a first time fund. And I mean, I guess part of that just comes down to pattern recognition. You know, I've uh, reviewed like literally thousands of private funds over the years and, you know, after you look at so many, you know, they're just like it, like as an early stage investor, you have pattern recognition in terms of, you know, kind of um, your expectation around a successful startup and you're having a good feeling for why that might be the case. It's the same thing with funds. And, you know, when you're coming from an LP perspective where, you know, you review thousands of funds and, you know, there's just that, that sense of pattern recognition around, you know, your belief that a fund um, you know, can truly provide asset returns and kind of develop into, into a marquee firm, even without that, you know, kind of depth of the prior track record. Got it. So w- where do you see the future of uh, the crypto venture uh, f- firms and uh, crypto venture uh, funds? You know, wh- what do you see is going to be the, the core development of this uh, ecosystem? Do you think there's going to be more and more the uh, and where are the traditional funds, uh, or uh, as opposed to crypto uh, venture funds, where are they raising themselves money, right? You know, so that because mm-hmm. that people usually don't talk about it. Like, you know, you're one of the probably only like few sources of their investments, right? But where do you see other investors are coming from usually? Yeah. So in terms of the, the fund landscape and where I see that going, uh, it, it's definitely growing and continues to grow. So, you know, for context, we, like we kind of do an annual, annual, I guess you'd call it a report on you know, what the landscape looks like. And as of last April, we were tracking 49 funds. As of this April, we we're tracking 65 and now we're up to you know, about 68 or so. 
So you know, it is definitely growing uh, in terms of having more and more dedicated funds in this space. And you know, I, I do expect um, you know over, over the short to medium term that these funds will continue to be the primary source of capital for startups in this space, and you know the most desired partners for startups. Um, and you, you, know, you just really haven't seen uh, you know the generalist venture funds come into the space in a meaningful way. There's obviously except, obviously exceptions. There are some you know there. Are maybe a small number, but there are some generalist funds that do a good job in this space. Um, but, you know, there's many more who I'd say are more of the tourist nature where, you know, they came in in like 2017 and 18 because they felt they had to. And then as soon as that mania went away, they also went away. Um, and if you're not spending your full-time attention in this space, it's just so hard to have proper context of what the market looks like, keep up with all the, you know, rapid pace of innovation, you know, what are all the different startups and, you know, between the technical and financial and all the different you know, aspects that come into diligence in this space, um, you know, the dedicated funds and the folks who are dedicated to this space personally, I, I expect will continue to thrive over the long term. Um, you know, I also think we'll see, you know, well, maybe continue to see, but, the, you know, the, the need to participate for those who are doing token investments and, you know, whether it's staking or running nodes or just being very involved in terms of you know, helping to provide liquidity to some of these like decentralized exchanges and, and folks like that. Um, I think that piece of it, folks who have a you know, much more kind of forward thinking view on how they interact with the underlying networks also will, you know, thrive over the long term. And you'll, you'll see that continue to be more important. In terms of like, where the capital is coming from, um, you know, you haven't seen... I don't know, the, the institutional wave of capital that many had been forecasting for a period of time. Uh, it definitely tends to be more from individuals and families. Uh, that said, I mean, there are plenty of institutions who have put capital into the space. Um, you know, a lot of the notable endowments, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, you know, UNC, a lot of, a lot of them that aren't public as well, have been actively investing in this space. You know, the ones you kind of think of being the most forward thinking and eventually, you know, you'll have folks follow on, follow on to. Um, you know, they have been primarily focused on some of the more familiar names, right? So a lot of those folks have been LPs and folks like Andreessen Horowitz or Paradigm. Um, and you haven't seen as much of a willingness at any scale at least for, you know, institutions to kind of build uh, net new relationships in that manner. And there's, there's of course, exceptions, but you just haven't seen that, you know, in mass, um, like I think a lot of folks have been kind of waiting for and expecting. Sure. Yeah, I, I think we're in the same shoes right here, like, because uh, everybody is having, like, similar challenges. And I, during the COVID, it's not easy to raise money, obviously. It uh, didn't become easier because people are putting all the investments on hold. Uh, but but it's still moving like slow, surely, but slowly it started uh, to be more active. Yeah. Uh, I would now, say, yeah. Oh, for what it's worth, I mean, despite saying that, like I, I've also seen those same groups spending more and more time learning and, you know, the subset of that world that is interested in the space and taking the time to learn and get educated continue to increase. So, you know, that on the flip side, that's been obviously very positive to see. And there's, you know, there's clearly a growing awareness amongst institutional LPs about this space and okay, we need to understand what's going on and you know, eventually that will lead to more institutional capital flowing in. Um, you know, and you know, now that they've gone through or are going through that that education process, which is of course very important. So I, I want to ask you uh, also one question about geography and about the also the uh, the split. So uh, the geographical split of the venture funds. So you mentioned that you are tracking about sixty nine rand of them, uh, but uh, uh, in the recent report there it was told that globally there is more than four hundred different crypto venture firms. Right now. Uh, do you have any preference? Like, for example, you would invest only in U.S.-based firms, or you would also consider some of the firms that are in Europe and Middle East or Asia? Yeah. So, uh, I guess one thing to address first is kind of your definition of of like a crypto VC fund. So, you know, when when you speak, for for example, I mean, you know this well, of course, but you know, when you're talking about like a universe of 400 funds, that's a much broader definition of what constitutes a, a blockchain or crypto VC fund than what we consider a blockchain VC fund. So for us, you know, it's, 
uh, it largely comes down to structure, right? So we are only tracking closed end blockchain venture funds. And, you know, that universe, and I, I think we have a pretty holistic view on it, as I mentioned, is, you know, about 68. I'm, I'm sure there's a couple more in there as well. But, um, you know, the, if, when you see the larger numbers, that tends to include, you know, liquid structured funds or, you know, hedge funds that call themselves crypto venture funds, given that the, you know, the kind of the, the long-term approach that they might take, or some of the hybrid funds that are structured kind of as like less liquid hedge funds. And, you know, we can get more into the details of exactly what those look like, but, um, you know, we, we consider those a different, a different strategy than, you know, what we truly consider blockchain venture, given um, how the structure uh, influences your investment approach and what you can and cannot invest in, you know, in allocations and such. So it is a much broader universe, but we are solely focused on the portion of that that is actually closed end venture. Um, that said, you know, the, the portion that we focus on, you know, it's about 70% US. So, you know, if you look at where the funds are, it's about 70% of the funds are located in the United States. Uh, the other 30% are primarily split between Europe and Asia. So, you know, there are a couple that are outside of those reasons, but for the most part, it's the rest is split between Europe and Asia. Uh, the US also tends to have larger funds. So if you look at the amount of capital that those funds have, the US has even a larger share in terms of the amount of dollars um, of the venture funds here, just because they tend to be larger in size and have been around for longer. So the funds in you know, Europe in particular tend to be, be a bit, uh, a little smaller um, and, and likewise in Asia. But, you know, it's very important to us to have global exposure. Uh, and I think if you're investing in this space in general, that's super important. You know, it's all open source technology. It's developed globally, you know, much more from day one than, for example, when the internet came into being and, you know, the U.S. had a, a, such a, a big advantage in that space. Uh, if you look at the data around startup activity, it's much more global than it is in the traditional venture world. So, you know, the U.S. has a smaller share of blockchain startup activity than it does for traditional, you know, venture or other tech startup activity. And in particular, Asia is has taken most of that delta of the U.S.'s share. Europe has taken a little, but most of it's gone to Asia, just given, you know, a, a lot of the, you know, crypto activity you see out there and, you know, so if, if you look at the data, the U.S. actually has less than 50% of blockchain startup activity share. So, you know, if you think about what's going on around the world, how much innovation is happening in Europe and Asia, it's, you know, it's incredibly important in my view that you take a global approach and, and view when investing in this space. Since we're talking about geography, right, I, I, I'm lucky to be in San Francisco, you know, the, the <laughs> coldest summer that you can have. <laughs> and oh, man, That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I know that you're in Portland, Oregon, right? Uh, so, so quite exotic place for, for a venture firm, right? So um, maybe uh, you can, you know, share a few words like why this particular choice and, uh, you know, how do you know any other funds that are also in uh, Oregon? Yeah, so, I mean, the, the real answer to why we're in Portland is just because I'm, I'm from here and, you know, my, my family really likes it here. Uh, you know, my, my wife's from here as well, so all of our family is, is in this area. And, yeah, you know, I guess when you, when you start a new firm, you have the luxury of doing it from where you, where you want. So <laughs> we decided to, uh, to do it here in Portland. But, I mean, that said, you know, so, you know, we do, as I mentioned earlier, you know, really two things. We invest in funds as an LP, blockchain venture funds, and then we invest directly in the equity of companies, but it's series B and later. So these are more, you know, mature startups. So, I mean, the need to be on the ground you know, if you're not doing early stage investing, really doesn't matter. I mean, we could execute on the strategy from effectively anywhere. And yeah, the farther you get away from like San Francisco, New York, you know, maybe you have to travel a little more just to be on the ground. But, you know, in terms of our ability to execute, it's, it's effectively irrelevant, which is wonderful because it means that, you know, you can see firms um, starting in different places and not purely in the Bay Area and New York. Um, and, you know, if, if you were, you know, interested in this world and you're in Oregon, for example, you basically have, you know, no other options. <laughs> so, you know, from a, a talent perspective, 
uh, it's much less competitive from that, you know, on that side of things as well. And you know, my prior firm, for example, which has been uh, very, very successful, uh, Greenspring Associates, I mean, they're based in Baltimore, also not exactly a, a tech hub. So you know, it just really comes down to the relationships you build, and you know, again, maybe you have to travel a little more, but um, you know, fortunately, given what we do, you know, we can effectively execute that strategy from any location. No, it's great because I the, the biggest chunk uh, of funds, as we know, like are located, you know, California, then probably New York, right? You know, Texas, Boston, right? And then uh, I'm happy to see that now it's getting diversified and people actually are starting on uh, new funds from the places where, you know, they have never been before. And that gives a lot of, I, I hope, reassurance and hope for other uh, people who might be listening to this and they see maybe you will find some... Uh, uh, brothers in crypto, right, <laughs> who are living in the same city, right, and they will also try to open, uh, uh, maybe not a competitor, but just a venture firm, and uh, that, that I think, th this process of globalization, and uh, where it, it doesn't really matter where we are already, right, it, it matters, like, you know, your strategy, the add value, uh, which specifically brings me to the next question, right? If somebody's listening right now, they really like what you do and they think that that's a relevant strategy. Can you say, um, you know, uh, can you bring us uh, a little bit more, um, I would say, add value, some of the arguments, why, um, you know, venture uh, fund of funds is uh, the most relevant strategy for uh, like the, your perfect LP? Because, you know, I, I can tell it's just like a small, also like, sharing a painful experience a lot of folks were saying like what why would we pay an extra one and ten right you know like when we can now it's so easy we go directly to the funds and then you have to explain what the add value so how do you present it and why do you think it's uh, still the best and the most relevant strategy yeah of course and i guess there's there's two pieces of that you know which is kind of why venture and then why fund of funds i'll, I'll focus on the fund of funds part and we can get into why venture if, if, mm -hmm. if you want to but you know, in terms of why why fund of funds you know, given our focus is on the venture side of the world. Uh, I mean, this is a few things. One, you know, for, for smaller investors, of course, uh, you know, if they want to actually build out a portfolio, which, you know, is the appropriate way to invest in this space, in my view, um, you know, the minimums are such that you're going to have a very, very hard time actually allocating capital properly to a handful of different funds, for example. So, you know, from a very practical standpoint, um, you know, a fund of funds allows you to get that exposure. Diversification, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So diversification, especially, you know, when you don't have the ability to write a bunch of checks yourself, so allows you to get that through a single investment. Um, you know, the diversification in itself, I also, I also see is very valuable, such that, you know, as we were talking about earlier, you know, there's different geographies where these funds are located. It's very important to have, you know, diversified geographic exposure. You know, there's so many different approaches to this space. You know, blockchain is a very broad category. You know, you have folks who are focused on traditional financial infrastructure, you know, kind of very, let's say, futuristic crypto stuff. You know, folks who are focused on DeFi, folks who are focused more on, you know, non-financial uses of blockchains or, you know, digital securities and other types of digital assets. And, you know, each of these different funds has expertise in different areas and different view on things. And, you know, I think, that well-rounded portfolio offers you, you know, an ideal risk return, in my opinion, um, from from that perspective. And you know, to the point around the fact that all these are emerging managers, or at least for the most part, I consider you know a landscape of emerging managers. There's just a lot of selection risk, so you don't have that same level of certainty for this one fund. It's like, oh, well, this is Excel, so they've been doing it for 20 years. They're going to continue to do it. You just don't have that same type of um, you know, certainty like you do in the traditional venture world when you have this long track record and these very, very long established brands. So, you know, you might have a great thesis, hey, I'm going to go into blockchain, I'm going to go out and pick a great fund, and then just, you know, for whatever reason, maybe it's luck or maybe it's just the wrong choice. You know, it doesn't actually give you the exposure you had had hoped for. Um, so, you know, fund of funds can help you to to mitigate that and, you know, build a portfolio through a, a single investment, um, you know, from a practical perspective, it's also just, I mean, if you have the mindset that I do that you need to, you know, make a handful of commitments and have a diversified portfolio in this space, I mean, it's just a lot of time and effort to go out, who are all the funds, you know, understand the landscape, 
build those relationships, due diligence on those funds, have proper perspective around being able to compare the funds and you know which ones you should be having exposure to. And there's just not many LPs who, you know, have the the team and the bandwidth to do that. So, you know, it's a much more efficient way to to gain that exposure also from a, a time attention standpoint and having to manage, you know, one relationship versus, you know, five to 10 relationships or whatever that, that number might be. Um, I guess the last piece of it is just expertise as we talked about earlier, you know, for LPs, you know, some LPs obviously are pretty deep in this space, but for those who are, are you know, kind of more beginning and learning and, and less so, um, you know, being able to outsource that expertise is very valuable as well, where, you know, we understand what they're investing in. We have the network to do, you know, truly do a lot of referencing and understand, you know, as do you guys, um, you know, what, what are they, what are they investing in? You know, who are the desired partners to work with and, you know, just have the proper context for what they're investing. In. Your LPs, right? You know, maybe you can uh, um, also elaborate a little bit on the, uh, um, I would say perfect psychological portrait of the people who would invest in, <laughs> and you know, in such strategy, right? You know, what what do you consider is you know what what are they searching, right? Because you know, of course, we know we understand it's independent worth individuals, it's the family offices, right? Mo most of the time, right? You know, who will be mm -hmm. our, you know, usual suspects, but. What do you think they're actually searching, right? You know, with, I'm sure you're speaking to a lot of investors, right? And uh, what do you feel they're like? That's the, their pain point. Yeah, so it's it depends on who you're talking to. I guess there's a there's a couple. Um, you know, on the on the institutional side, you know, I'd say it primarily comes down to you know bandwidth and expertise and efficiency. You know, the, the idea of outsourcing it when, you know, most of those groups just don't have the time and team to truly dig into this space is very attractive. You know, we're, you know, we're going to know the landscape, you know, much better than they will and have a much better view on the underlying funds, the industry in general. So um, I, I found that institutions are much more open to a fund of funds in this space than they are in general, just given kind of the niche focus and expertise. Come from typically backgrounds of finance or tech. And there's, there's certainly exceptions, but, you know, folks who have like, oh, this is, this is really interesting because they come from financial tech, so they have like a, at least a, a basic understanding of it. Um, and, but, you know, they don't have the relationships with the venture funds and they see us as an attractive way to, to get that exposure through uh, a single investment. Um, you know, there are also some that are actually very deep in this space, but view us as a very attractive partner for them where, you know, maybe it's more of a hub and spoke approach where, you know, they invest with, with us as an LP, but they're also, you know, they're also investing in like funds themselves. And we help, we help them as a partner to evaluate those funds and we share diligence. And, you know, so they're doing kind of a mix of investing with us and also investing themselves in underlying funds. So, you know, the pain point is a bit, a little different depending on who we're talking to. So what are the best strategies that worked out uh, for you, you know, in fundraising? I'm sure that the, some of the techniques are changing as well, right? Because we, we are not able to see some of the folks like, you know, who we would prefer to see, right? And you know, like, there's no, that even, even drinking coffee is already like with always with a caveat, like social distancing, right? If that's the case, some, some people are preferring like not to see anyone at all. Like, right? so it's only Zoom that we're using or Skype or Hangouts, whatever. And do you see that it's becoming easier? Like the barrier of communication is like, is actually, uh, is becoming, you know, more like the reachable to, to any person on planet earth or, or you see the opposite that some, some of the people don't, don't try not to communicate at all. Right. Yeah. Well, I guess first off, I'm still drinking lots of coffee. I'm just doing it by myself <laughs> instead of in a social setting, but <laughs> nothing's changed on that side of things. Um, but to your, to your, your real question there, uh, I, I think, you know, it, when, when COVID really hit, you know, it was kind of back in March when the market started, you know, tanking and it was down with the market down over 10% in a week, the, you know, the equity markets. And everyone's like, okay, I need to step back here. What's going, you know, what's going on? You know, I need to kind of watch what's going to happen. Um, and, you know, since then, as you look at everything has been, been remote. So I think since that time, people have become increasingly open to making decisions purely over video call. And, you know, like, I mean, at the end of the day, if, if you're an investor and you find something that is very compelling, 
you know, do you want to miss out on it because you can't actually meet that, per, that individual in person? I mean, I guess there could be situations where the answer is yes, just because for whatever reason, you know, you, you can't get comfortable with that, that in-person meeting. Maybe they're in another country. You don't have the ability to truly reference them, whatever it might be. But often the answer is no, that they don't want to miss out on that. And I, I found that to be the case, you know, more and more as we've gone through this and people are more, you know, more uh, willing to make decisions purely based on, you know, video call meetings. Um, so that's been a positive trend. I also think, you know, for, you know, from a fundraising perspective for folks who got started like right before COVID hit or tried to start in the middle of it, it's, it's been much more difficult because they have, they ha didn't have that like prior time to build relationships and then have it move over to video call. They've been doing it from scratch, just a video call. So, you know, we, we, you know, we, we've been, um, you know, active for, you know, for a bit of time before that. So, uh, you know, we, I think have had more success on that side of things with ongoing conversations and, you know, those moving to video versus, Hey, we're going to go do this all purely over video with no uh, you know, prior work towards it. No, I, I agree. I mean, to me, it's actually like I finally pushed myself to do the uh, all the interviews, right? And I, I had like a whole bunch of excuses when <laughs> I was seeing people physically. I'm like, oh, why do I need to do that? Like, I can just speak to a person like, you know, I can meet in any part of the world or the conference. And now it's kind of like the new necessity. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I, I want to ask you, like, I'm sure that, you know, being around, you know, for some time in the space, you've seen like some some fun things you know like some comic situations you know like or uh i would not necessarily obnoxious but i would say like you know some uh out of the norm right so maybe you can share some of some of those uh maybe one or two situations that you consider like you know really comic huh, that's uh that's a good question um Yeah, I mean, in terms of, you know, being in the position of an LP, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe it's less less comical, but <laughs> maybe just more of a factor of what stage this this market was at earlier on is, you know, we saw a lot of uh, folks who, you know, they they rode the ICO boom or made, made a bunch of money in crypto and then like, okay, you know, I, I'm now going to be a venture fund, right? Without really having any experience doing venture and purely just based off of them, you know, making a bunch of money, you know, flipping ICOs with no real, uh, you know, expertise and maybe got, I mean, uh, plenty of plenty of folks were, you know, knew what they were doing, but also plenty uh, that just kind of were, were gambling a bit. <laughs> and, you know, those those folks have largely been not very successful in in their efforts, and a lot of those have have now gone away as a result. So maybe 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 it's not comical, but that's definitely been a unique aspect that we've seen in this space, where you know people have like really really aggressive fundraising targets, and they're like, all right, I'm I'm, I'm super good at crypto, so I'm going to go out and raise this really really big fund, and I think you know the realization of you know actually raising money. For, for something like this as, uh, you know, they didn't quite grasp what that process was like. So yeah, that's, you know, you, you certainly see the traditional brunch world as well, but I think it was much more exaggerated um, in, in this space, you know, at kind of as uh, because of the ICO boom and then kind of the you know, remnants of that thereafter, you know, today it's, it's, it's much different, but we saw a lot of that. I mean, you know, you, you definitely run into a lot of characters, <laughs> A lot of interesting folks uh, in this space and you know I think people are you know a, a little more casual and colorful and you definitely are you know interact with some pretty pretty colorful characters uh, relative to you know even just the, the regular tech world which is yeah makes it kind of fun and fun and interesting yeah, I think there is uh, at some point like this confluence between the people from uh, Burning Man style uh, and who are hedge fund managers and, and folks from like, you know, Wall Street style and they kind of 
a lot of them merged together. Some of them like were separate entities and uh, that was fun to watch, right? So um, the, the other question, I'm sure you read a lot of news and articles and researches, you know, like uh, research papers. Uh, maybe you can recommend the sources of your inspiration and your daily reads, you know, like which, how do you track the market? And uh, the, the other question is like, maybe you can recommend a book that you recently read and uh, you consider sharing with the community. Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, in terms of, you know, news, so, you know, I, I subscribe to some, some newsletters, uh, you know, I certainly recommend the block, which is, you know, well-known one within this space. Uh, you know, they could do a good job as a dedicated outlet news outlet within this space. Um, you know, for DeFi specifically, uh, I subscribe to the Defiant, which does a very good job of breaking down what's going on in the DeFi space in particular. Um, you know, Coindesk has a num number of newsletters. I, I subscribe to one or two of them because there's quite a few, but um, you know, those are, are very helpful as well. So yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, good blogs and new letter newsletters that are that are out there. Um, you know, some of the venture funds, of course, we just, you know, kind of, uh, subscribe to those as well, or, you know, we just get them, I guess, uh, you know, because of the relationships. Um, but, you know, a lot of, frankly, a lot of my reading also just comes from things like Twitter, where people post articles that are really interesting. And, you know, a, a lot of reading comes from that and, you know, digging into things that you, you hear about on there even. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll spare trying to list off a bunch of people that I'd recommend following, but, you know, for people who are trying to learn, that's a, you know, is a, a pretty efficient source as long as you can kind of look through all the, you know, uh, uh, uninformed comments and the fact that anyone can comment on anything. So <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, books, I mean, book, yes. most, of been, most of the books I've been reading have been to my kids. So, you know, I, I recommend uh, Grim Fairy Tales. Those have been good. Uh, <laughs> you know, okay. Some others that... I've been reading to my kids, uh, but I, you know, I haven't haven't done a lot of uh, real book reading recently. Um, I, I'd say, to be honest, I'm much more of a music person. So in my downtime, I like to listen to music. You know, I find that um, it'd be very valuable for me, and you know, listen really to almost every type of music. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, prior life was a classically trained musician. So you know, it's just a, an area of passion for me. And what yeah, instrument? Uh, flute and tenor saxophone. Okay. Yeah, so not, not a lot of male flautists out there. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's a lot of fun. But, um, but, but yeah, so I, I, I don't play as much as I used to, but, you know, both playing and as well as just listening to all sorts of different kinds of music, I, I'd say I spend more time doing that than, you know, than uh, you know, reading books, actually. Perfect. No, I think it's also music is, uh, is very... Uh, developing a uh, tool as well right and, and uh, we all have different approaches to how we perceive information so uh you know some people are kind of ecstatic you know like some people are like to listen some people like you know more visual learning and uh, uh i think uh, would you mention for this strategy for venture fund the funds is quite interesting I, I i actually don't know other funds who are doing the same strategy maybe did you hear about like at least one competitor of yours i'm just curious uh, yeah, we, so we do have competitors. I guess there are, are two in particular. I think of one, which you know looks like us. There's a second that uh, I would com I would consider a competitor. Yeah, of course. So th there are I guess two competitors of ours. Uh, you know, two two firms I consider competitive. Um, you know, to be honest, the, the market uh, still has plenty of room for everyone. So I don't you know uh, feel it's overly competitive in that nature. But definitely our competitors of ours. One. I'd say it looks most like us where they're doing, I don't think all, but primarily closed and venture. Uh, and I, they may do some direct investing as well. They don't, I don't know if or exactly how much of that they do from their fund. There's a second that I would consider a competitor, but they are much more flexible in structures. So they do both closed and closed and venture as well as, you know, more liquid, um, liquid funds. Um, so, you know, a little different than ours. They're also not doing any direct investing, but I would, I would consider that, them competitive given given the focus and they are doing a, a fair amount in uh you know venture venture strategies um so there's a there's a little competition there's not there's not a whole lot i mean these are folks i'm very friendly with we trade notes on funds 
Um, you know, so it's much more friendly than some sort of, you know, big fierce competition or anything like that. <laughs> of course. I mean, so do we, we are like, we also see a lot of other fund of funds who we're very friendly with and we share a lot of information together. There's no, there's no issue whatsoever. Like the market is big enough to, uh, to actually be collaborative, like rather than just competitive. So uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, what probably people should know that the end, like, uh, what, what is your lockup period? Like, so it's a long-term strategy, right? You know, like, and uh, it's definitely like people in, like who invest in venture typically is people who, you know, they actually share the vision, right? And, uh, um, you know, for someone who is, uh, let's say, let's imagine, like, is a bit skeptical about like a long-term lockup period, what would you say? Yeah, so I guess in terms of what our structure looks like first, you know, we're, we're a 10-year term. There are some that might have like six or eight-year terms, but if they're doing equity investing, they're going to end up basically just having a lot of extensions. <laughs> so in, in a certain way, it's kind of semantics, aside from maybe the, the fee schedule, if it might step down a little more quickly. But I mean, if you're investing in venture, I mean, in my view, it needs to be done through a long-term uh, illiquid vehicle. And especially, I mean, well, I mean, absolutely, if you're investing in equity too, because I mean, you can't, you can't have a people the ability to draw down their capital. Um, and if you did, you would be forced to sell equity positions in startups, which is a, a big no-no being forced to do that as a venture investor. So, you know, that would be a very difficult structure. Um, and, you know, the exposure that we provide is majority equity. So the only way to do that is through a close end fund where you can invest, you can continue following on. You don't have to worry about that capital being, you know, drawn by your LPs and being forced to do, um, you know, unwanted sales. You know, you really need to be long-term partners for these funds, long-term focused. And, you know, if you're not, that's going to over time, you know, uh, come back to bite you from a deal flow and reputation standpoint. Um, you know, that despite being a illiquid structure, you know, we still do have exposure to tokens, you know, some of which are liquid from day one, others which become liquid in a relatively short period of time, you know, compared to traditional equity. So, you know, even for an illiquid fund, there is the potential for, um, you know, for to have distributions more quickly than you might for a traditional venture fund. Uh, the only difference is that that is at the discretion of the GP, whether they recycle that capital, whether they distribute those, those early distributions, um, you know, versus actually being able to you know, redeem your, your interest and having the fund itself be, be liquid. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I like the, the illiquid structure and the long-term incentives and alignment between GP and LP. And I mean, you can just as easily do token and other crypto investments from an illiquid fund. And, you know, at the same time, you're not forced to, um, well, you, you, you can take a very long-term perspective instead of having to worry about redemptions or annual carry or whatever it might be. Got it. So what would be your last, uh, I don't know, uh, recommendation or advice to the people who are listening? So clear, clearly your, your audience is already doing it by you know, listening to awesome podcasts like this. Uh, but just, you know, understanding what is going on in the world of blockchain and crypto and just taking the time to, you know, you don't have to become an expert just, but understand, you know, what, what is, you know, what is crypto? I mean, not all cryptocurrencies are the same, for example, and people just think crypto and they think of Bitcoin and, you know, 2000 Bitcoin copycats. You know, it's actually a very diverse set of different types of tokens doing very different things. Um, you know, why does, why does crypto exist in the first place? And, you know, what, what is blockchain useful for? Like, what, what is it actually good for? And then, you know, then being able to understand how you might apply it and just, you know, just take time to read and learn and, you know, be, be open-minded. Uh, Cause I think it's easy to look at this space and just like, Oh, ICOs, you know, crypto is bad, but, you know, take an open-minded view and uh, you know, people draw their own conclusions. But uh, I think, you know, taking the time to learn about something that could be a huge part of the future is, is well worthwhile. Um, you know, I also, I also think from a, you know, monetary perspective, people should, you know, think about, you know, their own money and, you know, their, their investments and, uh, you know, how much influence that government actions are 
are having on the value of money and the values of, of investments these days. Um, and I, you know, wh whatever that leads you to do is, is up to individuals, but I think understanding that dynamic, you know, for those who have 401ks and have, um, you know, broader portfolios is, is very important. Thank you. It's becoming more and more of a, uh, of a factor to consider when looking at investments these days. <laughs> No, for sure. I think long-term vision is still there. Like even though people are, they're stressed, there's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of uh, inconsistencies. There's a lot of, uh, um, there's a lot of just generally panic because people don't actually know what's going to happen like in the coming month, not, not to say in the coming year or 10 years. But at the same time, you know, there, even though the risk is like it just psychologically it's growing, but I think, the innovations are still going and there's a lot of great projects that are appearing and there's more and more venture firms, as you mentioned, are also becoming uh, uh, institutional grade and that means they have uh, ability to grow and scale. So, you know, on my side, I would just wish everyone like growth. I would, uh, uh, healthy growth, you know, like also uh, meaning like, you know, that even if somebody is sending you $100 million, they will not ask you tomorrow to uh, uh, to spare some, uh, you know, some of your pride or some of your principles, right? But generally, I, I believe that there is a high demand uh, on a serious note. There's an interest in this space and uh, what, you're, what you're doing, I think, is very valuable. It's an, it's a, it's an important addition to the ecosystem and uh, I wish you luck. I, I wish you success. I wish you raise more money and to sponsor <laughs> more, more venture firms so that they instead, like they will invest in great projects and we will see some killer apps finally. Yeah. Well, you know, li likewise on, on all the above there and I, I appreciate the kind words. So, so thank you very much, Constantine. Thank you, Bruce.